Good morning, everybody. I hope today is finding you well. Um, continue to pray for me. I'm improving health-wise, but still uh, a little bit of pain, a little bit of discomfort. But, you know, God is still good no matter how I feel about it. So um, I just want to say thank you for the prayers. I covet them. I'm going to continue to do so. So today's question um, I have to have it on my computer because, for whatever reason, our office printer is not working. Pray about that because we've got to get stuff done for Sunday. But uh, today's question comes from a longtime contributor to our um, podcast. And here's what he asks Do we use trickery to convert people? So here's an interesting question Is using trickery to get people to go to God a good idea or even just? Or is it not God's way at all? Way back in the days of the Vikings, the Christian faith was trying to get the pagan Vikings to convert. In a fit of brilliance, a bishop or a priest, I forget which, studied the faith of the pagans and came up with an idea. He went before several tribes and said, you're worshiping the old ways. In the Bible, it says before the time of Adam and Eve, there was a land of giants. Now, pause right there. Uh, it actually says before the flood, there was giants, the Nephilim. That's in Genesis. You can look it up the Genesis account. So you still believe it is, but it is not. You should be following our God, not the ways you are now. Some Vikings took him at his word after being shown in the Bible where the evidence was. They compared notes, so to speak, and saw that the priest was right and many converted. Those who didn't put God to the test, challenging the Christians to walk across hot coals. They believed that the fire would only burn a liar. Long story short, Christians won the bet. But it makes me think that we use trickery, not love, or the truth to convert the Vikings. That doesn't sound very Christian to me. Using Satan's own trick is not our way, or, or so I believe. What does the Bible say? So, I, I really honestly don't view this as trickery. I, I think that to deceive somebody is absolutely wrong. Um, and I think in the term... Of deception, that's what trickery can mean. However, Jesus used terms people could understand to explain the things of God. You look at many of the parables. He talks about planting seeds. He talks about tending sheep. He talks about things people understood. In the same way, these uh, priests or monks or whomever they may have been came to these pagan Vikings, and they studied who they were first. They understood who they were. They understood their rules, their laws, um, their their traditions. And what they did was they uh, came in and they used what these Viking people knew to explain the mysteries of God. Now, there's two biblical precedents for this, um, apart from Christ, of course. But I want to kind of show you where I'm coming from on this. Paul writes this. And I'm going to show what he writes, then I'm going to show how he actually used it. Paul writes this to the Corinthians. He said in verse uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 19, Although I'm a free man and not anyone's slave, I've made myself a slave to everyone in order to win more people. To the Jews, I became like a Jew. To win Jews. To those under the law, like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law. To win those under the law. To those who are without the law like one without the law, not being without God's law, but within Christ's law, to win those without the law. To the weak, I became like the weak, in order to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by every possible means I might save some. Now I do all this because the gospel, so I may become a partner in its benefits. Now you might recall what Paul says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for those who believe, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. So if I look at it from that perspective, not in a sense of deceiving anybody, what these Christian missionaries did to these Viking tribes wasn't trick or deceive them. What they did was they said, okay, here's what you believe. Here's what God's word, the Bible says. So let's explain this. You're worshiping things that don't exist anymore. It said it existed at one point, but now it doesn't. And, and here you are still worshiping these old ways. And here's what Jesus Christ has shown us through his word. 
Now, I'm going to tell you, these Vikings have had some run-in at this point with Jews. So they're familiar with the Jewish rule of law. They're familiar with all those things. And so they used things that were already established. The mythos that the pagan Vikings believed, the, the Jewish uh, tradition, which was spread throughout all of um, Europe and even much of the world at that point. And of course, God's word, the Bible, the Old and New Testaments, what they had put together at the time. So you see, they, they use what was established to explain the spiritual, just as Jesus did. Now, Paul is not a do-as-I-say-not-as-I-do preacher. Listen to what he did when he went to Athens in Acts chapter 17, verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was troubled within him when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worshipped God. See, there was Jews and there were Greek, fear, God-fearing people. And in the marketplace every day to those who happened to be there. Then also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers argued with him. Some said, what is this pseudo-intellectual trying to say? Back then in Athens, they would get together and, and discuss nothing but philosophy and new thoughts in certain places. Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus and said, may we learn about this new teaching you're speaking of? So see, they were curious. He piqued his curiosity, or their curiosity. For what you say sounds strange to us, and we want to know what these ideas mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling or hearing something new. They got together and discussed philosophy. That was all they wanted to do. So here's what Paul did. He reached them where they were at. Paul stood in the mirror of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that you're extremely religious in every aspect. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar which was inscribed to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. Just as those missionaries did with the giants, Paul's doing here in Athens. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in shrines made by hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. From one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets. See here, he goes and reaches into their own poets. Listen. For we are also his offspring. Now, he's citing from a third century Greek poet named Aratus. You see, he's using their tradition, their uh, way of thinking, their philosophy, to reach out to them. Verse 29, Being God's offspring then, we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So you see, Paul used something they understood and knew. Now, it seems to me like this story you're talking about, the Christians walking over the coals, God does not honor certain deceptions. There are certain deceptions he honored within the Bible. For example, the Old Testament, when uh, Pharaoh ordered all the baby boys to be killed as soon as they were born, but the... Um, Jewish midwives, they, they said, oh, these women are so strong. They've already had the babies by the time we get there. We can't, we can't do anything about it. So there's certain kinds of deception that is for the good of another human being. But in this way, if you look at the story, they walked over the hot coals without being burned. God honored them by reaching out where they were at, by going into their traditions not deceiving them, but by proving they didn't exist. In the same way, two of my favorite authors, J.R.R. Tolkien, who
who was a devout Catholic and um, at the time C.S. Lewis, who was a um, agnostic, uh, he, he went from being an atheist to being an agnostic. Um, after World War I, they were uh, fellows together at Oxford, had a debate that, uh, and, and a, a series of several debates, they became good friends. And they're talking about the essence of mythology. And C.S. Lewis, you know, um, was a, a fan of, the, of, of um, mythology. He loved mythology. And Tolkien pointed out to him that mythology points us towards the divine nature of God because we're all trying to explain God in our own way, but there's only one true knowledge of it. And that knowledge always should bring us back to it. So just in the same way as this priest or bishop did, so too did uh, C.S. Lewis convince, or J.R.R. R. Tolkien convince C.S. Lewis that God existed by pointing out the mythos of humanity, the common threads throughout it, and how each one deviated from the truth, and how Christ brought everything back into focus on what truth really was. Meeting people where they're at to get them to where God is at. That's what becoming all things to all men that by all means we might save some. This doesn't mean we compromise in any way. This doesn't mean that we compromise the word of God or change it. This means that we use the word of God uh, in conjunction with what people know so that they too may have a, a, a knowledge of God. There was a, for example, a tribe in South America. They were cannibals from what I understand. And they believed that there was this God in a volcano that was going to burn them up because of their sins, their, their wrongdoings. And no matter how much they, they tried, they couldn't ever appease this God. And so missionaries came to South America and they explained to them what heaven and hell would be like. And, and because of their understanding, because of their mythos, using the word of God, this tribe was able to see and know and the Holy Spirit was able to convict and they became Christians and ceased being cannibals. So... It's not using trickery. It's using what they know and understand and relating it to Scripture and relating it to the Word of God to prove uh, to them and to, to, of course, with the Holy Spirit's uh, power and interpretation, convict and, and bring all men to repentance. It's part of Christ's mandate to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching to obey all he's commanded us. You see, that is what we're there to do. Not fool people, not trick people, not deceive people. There's too many charlatans doing that. But using the truth of God's word to point out how everybody gets it so close to the mark, and yet there is only one truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He's exclusive in that. And so if we know someone's customs and traditions, and we could point them to Christ using those, we are honoring the message that God told us to go and give by getting to know them, by, by honoring them and, and, and knowing their customs so that way they can come to know Christ. I hope that makes sense. Let me know what you think. I hope that answers your question. Keep answering questions. We're back. Uh, there's only going to be one week this year that or this month that I may not answer, but I, I very well might. We'll see as the Lord leads. God bless you, and may he keep you. I love you. Let me know what you think of all this in the comments.